Dutch Fairy Tales for Young Folks by William Elliot Griffiths The Entangled Mermaid Long ago, in Dutch fairyland, there lived a young mermaid who was very proud of her good looks. She was one of a family of mer, or lake folks, dwelling not far from the sea. Her home was a great pool of water that was half salt and half fresh, for it lay around an island near the mouth of a river. Part of the day, when the sea tides were out, she splashed and played, dived and swam in the soft water of the inland current. When the ocean heaved and the salt water rushed in, the mermaid floated and frolicked and paddled to her heart's content. Her father was a gray-bearded merry man and very proud of his handsome daughter. He owned an island near the river mouth where the young mermaids held their picnics and parties and received the visits of young merry men. Her mother and two aunts were merwomen. All of these were sober folks and attended to the business which occupies all well-brought-up mermaids and merrymen. This was to keep their pool clean and nice. No frogs, toads, or eels were allowed near. But in the work of daily house cleaning, the storks and the mermaids were great friends. All water creatures that were not thought to be polite and well-behaved were expected to keep away. Even some silly birds, such as loons and plovers, and all screaming and fighting creatures with wings, were warned off the premises because they were not wanted. This family of merry folks liked to have a nice, quiet times by themselves, without any rude folks on legs or with wings or fins from the outside. Indeed, they wished to make their pool a model for all respectable mermaids and merrymen for ten leagues around. It was very funny to see the old daddy merman, with a switch made of reeds, shooing off the saucy birds, such as the sandpipers and screeching gulls, for the bullfrogs, too big for the storks to swallow, and for impudent fishes he had a whip made of seaweed. Of course, all mermaids in good society were welcome, but young mermen were allowed to call only once a month, during the week when the moon was full. Then the evenings were usually clear, so that when the party broke up, the mermen could see their way in the moonlight to swim home safely with their mermaid friends. For there were sea monsters that loved to plague the merfolk, and even threatened to eat them up. The mermaids, dear creatures, had to be escorted home, but they felt safe, for their mermen brothers and daddies were so fierce that, except sharks, even the larger fish, such as porpoises and dolphins, were afraid to come near them. One day, Daddy and Mother left to visit some relatives near the island of Urk. They were to be gone several days. Meanwhile, their daughter was to have a party, her aunts being the chaperones. The mermaids usually held their picnics on an island in the midst of the pool. Here they would sit and sun themselves. They talked about fashions and the prettiest way to dress their hair. Each one had a pocket mirror, but where they kept these while swimming, no mortal ever found out. They made wreaths of bright-colored seaweed, orange and black, blue, gray, and red, and wore them on their brows like coronets. Or they twined them, along with sea berries and bubble blossoms, among their tresses. Sometimes they made girdles of the strongest and knotted them around their waists. Every once in a while they chose a queen of beauty for their ruler. Then each of the others pretended to be a princess. Their games and sports often lasted all day, and they were very happy. Swimming out in the salt water, the mermaids would go in quests of pearls, coral and ambergris, and other pretty things. These they would bring to their queen, or with them richly adorn themselves. Thus the mermaid queen and her maidens made a court of beauty that was famed wherever mermaids and merry men lived. They often talked about human maids. How funny it must be to wear clothes, said one. Are they cold that they need to keep warm? It was a little chit of a mermaid, whose flippers had hardly begun to grow into hands, that asked this question. How can they swim with petticoats on? asked another. My brother heard that real men wear wooden shoes. These must bother them when on the water to have their feet floating, said a third, whose name was Silver Scales. What a pity they don't have flukes like us. And then she looked at her own glistening scaly coat in admiration. I can hardly believe it, 
said a mermaid that was very proud of her fine figure and slender waist. Their girls can't be half as pretty as we are. Well, I should like to be a real woman for a while, just to try it and see how it feels to walk on legs, said another, rather demurely, as if afraid the other mermaids might not like her remark. They didn't. Out sounded a lusty chorus. No, no, horrible. What an idea. Who wouldn't want to be a mermaid? Why, I've heard, cried one, that real women have to work, wash their husband's clothes, milk cows, dig potatoes, scrub floors, and take care of calves. Who would be a woman? Not I. And her snub nose, since it could not turn up, grew wide at the roots. She was sneering at the idea that a creature in petticoats could ever look lovelier than one in shining scales. Besides, she said, think of their big noses, and I'm told, too, that girls have even to wear hairpins. At this, the very thought that anyone should have to bind up their tresses. There was a shock of disgust with some, while others clapped their hands, partly in envy and partly in glee. But the funniest thing the mermaids heard of were gloves, and they laughed heartily over such things as covers for the fingers. Just for fun, one of the little mermaids used to draw some bag-like seaweed over her hands to see how such things looked. One day, while sunning themselves in the grass on the island, one of their number found a bush on which foxgloves grew. Plucking these, she covered each one of her fingers with a red flower. Then, flopping over to the other girls, she held up her gloved hands. Half in fright and half in envy, they heard her story. After listening, the party was about to break up, when suddenly a young merman splashed into view. The tide was running out and the stream low, so he had had hard work to get through the fresh water of the river to the island. His eyes dropped salt water, as if he were crying. He looked tired while puffing and blowing, and he could hardly get his breath. The queen of the mermaids asked him what he meant by coming among her maids at such an hour and in such condition. At this, the bashful merman began to blubber. Some of the mergirls put their hands over their mouths to hide their laughing, while they winked at each other, and their eyes showed how they enjoyed the fun. To have a merman among them at that hour, in broad daylight, and crying, was too much for dignity. Boo-hoo, boo-hoo, and the merman still wept salt water tears as he tried to catch his breath. At last, he talked sensibly. He warned the queen that a party of horrid men in wooden shoes with pickaxes, spades, and pumps were coming to drain the swamp and pump out the pool. He had heard they would make the river a canal and build a dike that should keep out the ocean. Alas, alas, cried one mermaid, wringing her hands. Where shall we go when our pool is destroyed? We can't live in the ocean all the time. Then she wept copiously. The salt water tears fell from her great round eyes in big drops. Hush, cried the queen. I don't believe the merman's story. He only tells it to frighten us. It's just like him. In fact, the queen suspected that the merman's story was all a sham and that he had come among her maids with a set purpose to run off with silver scales. She was one of the prettiest mermaids in the company, but very young, vain and frivolous. It was no secret that she and the merman were in love and wanted to get married. So the queen, without even thanking him, dismissed the swimming messenger. After dinner, the company broke up and the queen retired to her cave to take a long nap. She was quite tired after entertaining so much company. Besides, since daddy and mother were away and there was no bows to entertain, since it was a dark night and no moon shining on the water, why need she get up early in the morning? So the mermaid queen slept much longer than ever before. Indeed, it was not till near sunset the next day that she awoke. Then, taking her comb and mirror in hand, she started to swim and splash in the pool in order to smooth out her tresses and get ready for supper. But oh, what a change from the day before! What was the matter? All around her, things looked different. The water had fallen low and the pool was nearly empty. The river, instead of flowing, was as quiet as a pond. 
Horrors! When she swam forward, what should she see but a dike and fences? An army of horrid men had come when she was asleep and built a dam. They had fenced round the swamp and were actually beginning to dig sluices to drain the land. Some were at work building a windmill to help in pumping out the water. The first thing she knew, she had bumped her pretty nose against the dam. She thought at once of escaping over the logs and into the sea. When she tried to clamber over the top and get through the fence, her hair got so entangled between the bars that she had to throw away her comb and mirror and try to untangle her tresses. The more she tried, the worse became the tangle. Soon her long hair was all twisted up in the timber. In vain were her struggles to escape. She was ready to die with fright when she saw four horrid men rush up to seize her. She attempted to waddle away, but her long hair held her to the post and rails. Her modesty was so dreadfully shocked that she fainted away. When she came to herself, she found she was in a big, long tub. A crowd of curious little girls and boys were looking at her, for she was on show as a great curiosity. They were bound to see her and get their money's worth in looking, for they had paid a stiver, two cents, admission to the show. Again, before all these eyes, her modesty was so shocked that she gave one groan, flopped over, and died in the tub. Woe to the poor father and mother at Irk! They came back to find their old home gone. Unable to get into it, they swam out to sea, never stopping till they reached Spitzbergen. What became of the body of the mermaid queen? Learned men came from Leiden to examine what was now only a specimen, and to see how mermaids were made up. Then her skin was stuffed and glass eyes put in, where her shining orbs had been. After this, her body was stuffed and mounted in the museum, that is, set above a glass case and resting upon iron rods. Artists came to Leiden to make pictures of her, and no fewer than nine noblemen copied her pretty form and features into their coats of arms. Instead of the mermaid's pool is now a cheese farm of fifty cows, a fine house and barn, and a family of pink-cheeked, yellow-haired children who walk and play in wooden shoes. So this particular mermaid, all because of her entanglement in the fence, was more famous when stuffed than when living while all her young friends and older relatives were forgotten. End of Entangled Mermaid Recording by Jonathan Hooker